Hello? Hello, Neo. Uh, excuse me? Do you know who this is? No. Maybe someone called the wrong number. Today, I decided to feel nostalgia and found my ancient Nokia 3310. This phone is almost 20 years old and it still works. Just take a look at the legendary Space Impact game. It is noteworthy that the phone has got a liquid crystal display, which was very rare at that time. What do you think? How difficult and, most importantly, expensive is to make at least one working LCD pixel from this display? It's been over 20 years since this phone was released, and technologies have advanced significantly. That is why now it's quite easy to do that. Or maybe not really. Let's find out. I think nowadays many people can't imagine living without the smartphones. The displays can usually be divided into two major types, OLED screens and LED screens, which are also called IPS. Where 20 years ago things were much different, all displays back then were monochrome with LCD matrices. In the past they were also called liquid crystal displays. I remember the time when it was cool to have a liquid crystal monitor instead of a large display with a tube. The first time people came up with an idea to make liquid crystal displays was in 1964 when the first electro-optical effect of this material was discovered. In 1973 the Sharp company released the first liquid crystal display based on the twisted pneumatic effect of liquid crystals. Wait, wait, what are these pneumatic liquid crystals and how do they twist? May these difficult terms not scare you? And I will try to explain everything in simple terms. I think many of you have seen materials which are called crystals, such as pieces of quartz, metal crystals on the cross section of an iron rod, or some calcite crystals, which I found in Iceland. All these crystalline chemicals have a precise and organized structure, which is why they are in the solid state at normal temperatures. How can crystals be in the liquid state true? Because everyone is accustomed to the fact that crystals are solid. It turns out there are chemicals which under certain conditions can be both liquid and solid. Of course, it's hard to imagine. So, let me show you a couple of examples. If you didn't know it, some plants contain a chemical called horestyl benzoate, which in its pure form is a white powder. By the way, it feels like regular soap to the touch. However, this compound is known for something different. If we heat up this chemical with a construction fan, upon reaching its melting temperature, holystyryl benzoate melts and turns into a transparent liquid, just as many chemicals are supposed to do. When cooling, it doesn't just harden. It first turns into a murky semi-liquid of such a bluish color. It's a transition state of chemicals, and under a microscope, these liquid crystals look like something between a liquid and a solid. And, as we can see, these particles can even move. It looks quite unusual. If we let these crystals cool off more, this murky liquid in the jar starts hardening and forming irregular crystals, creating an insanely unusual optic effect of lighter refraction. In order for you not to get confused, let us compare how cholesterol benzoid and regular candle paraffin will melt and then harden. We can clearly see that upon cooling off, paraffin simply crystallizes without any irregularities. However, the liquid crystals undergo an interesting change of color. In the 19th century, this very experiment was used to discover the formation of liquid crystals. The scientific term describing such chemicals which refract light is holosteric liquid crystals. I don't know why they are called this way, however, it is what it is. By the way, they can be used as thermometers. 
if you mix some cholesterol derivatives in the proportions you can see on your screen. At the same time, you can choose such a ratio of chemicals that liquid crystals will be forming at a certain temperature, for instance, at a temperature slightly higher or slightly lower than our body temperature. In one of my previous videos, I even made such cars, which change their color upon being touched. These are quite interesting and unusual chemical toys with liquid crystals. Hmm, you may wonder, if these liquid crystals can change their color, then why is my old Nokia's display monochrome, rather than multichrome? The thing is, those liquid multicolored crystals I mentioned earlier were invented back in the 19th century, and today they don't have many applications. Nowadays more modern chemicals are used instead. Hmm, yes, this murky, semi-transparent liquid is made up of those modern liquid crystals, which can be found in my Nokia's display, as well as in other similar displays. In order not to dismantle a thousand displays, I bought such a bottle with the needed chemicals. By the way, they cost quite a lot. In contrast to the previous type of liquid crystals, which are called cholesteric crystals. This type of chemicals react with electric current, and that is why they are called pneumatic crystals. From a chemical point of view, these crystals are a chemical with such a long and hard to spell name, which enters a transition state in the form of liquid crystals at room temperatures. This means that if we freeze the content of the bottle, it will harden, and if we heat it up, it will boil. So, now you have learned what liquid crystals are, let's find out how they are used. I came up with an idea to try to make a do-it-yourself LCD pixel after watching this 7-year-old video from the Applied Science channel. This channel's creator, whose name is Ben, assembles unique setups, including making DIY liquid crystal displays, that is why I decided to repeat this experiment. In one of the videos, on this channel, there was a short description of how to make such a pixel, that is why basically I decided to do the same. First of all, to make such a pixel, I need to get electrical conductive glass from somewhere. In his video, Ben made such a glass himself, by plasma coating the glass with tin oxide and indium oxide layers, in a vacuum chamber. Since I don't have such special equipment, I decided to order such a glass from a Chinese manufacturer. Sometime later, I got a parcel inside which there were several glass sheets coated in fluorinated tin oxide, which creates a thin electrically conductive layer on the surface of the glass. Such glass is used for making touch screens or LCD panels. Since I got quite large glass sheets, I'm cutting them in half with the help of a diamond-tipped glass cutter. Thus, I have got two halves for making my pixel. First of all, to create a DIY LCD pixel, we need to apply a thin layer of some liquid on the surface of the electrically conductive layer of glass. To do that, I decided to follow Ben's advice and use photoresist spray, which contains some polymeric chemicals. To make a thinner polymer layer, I secured the glass sheet in a DIY centrifuge, and after that, I applied some photoresist on the surface of the glass. Thus, when the centrifuge spins, it removes the excess photoresist of the surface of glass, creating a super thin layer. After dry enough, we need to make micro scratches on the surface of the dried polymer, thus creating micro ridges, which will trap liquid crystals. Which is why I'm just rubbing the layer of dried photoresist with a regular piece of fabric. By the way, such a method of making liquid crystal displays, when polymer layers are rubbed with pieces of fabric, is still employed. The process now, however, is automated. People haven't come up with another way of making liquid crystals face in the needed direction. Now I need to make straight scratches on the electrically conductive sheets of glass, which are perpendicular to other sheets of glass. Thus, when electricity is applied, liquid crystals will be able to change their position. This picture illustrates how the process is supposed to happen. Here the display is off and here it is on. 
Now I just need to put a drop of these expensive liquid crystals between two sheets of glass and to put one light polarizer underneath the glass sheet and to cover it with another polarizer. That's an interesting effect, isn't it? When the polarizer is pinned, the image grows either lighter or darker and the layer of liquid crystals is constantly either light or dark. How is that possible? The thing is, from a physics point of view, light sprays as the waves, which are present almost in all dimensions. This is how it looks sideways. However, if we take a polarizer, which is a piece of plastic coated in a tiny microscopic shades, and make a beam of light pass through it, the light wave will be spreading only in one dimension, and other dimensions will be cancelled off. If we take two polarizers and overlay one polarizer with another one at 19 degrees, they will block passage of light altogether, because the microscopic shades completely shut when overlaid, thus blocking propagation of light waves. If we apply a drop of liquid crystals in between two sheets of glass with a polarizer, we will see how the crystal sprayed area starts latent in light or blocking it depending on the rotation of the polarizer. That's because of the scratch applied to the photoresist layer of the glass, which trap liquid crystals. Nowadays, a set of two polarizers are used in almost all LCD screens. I think you have noticed that when the top film is removed from an old display, the image disappears because the second polarizer doesn't block pixels needed for creating an image. In theory, if we apply voltage to two electrically conductive glass sheets, liquid crystals in between the glass sheets are supposed to align, thus creating the pattern I have engraved earlier and becoming either light or dark. However, there weren't precise instructions in Ben's video about the DIY LCD pixel. That is why I had to determine the right voltage and current intensity of my power supply manually. But no matter how hard I tried, I couldn't turn on my DIY LCD pixel. That is why I decided to turn to the internet for the help with this matter. An hour later, I did manage to find detailed instructions on how to make DIY and even more importantly working DIY LCD pixels. Can you guess what the problem was? It turns out there is a laboratory work carried out by the Massachusetts Institute of Technology or MIT on applied electromagnetics and published in 2011. This work is part of the university's free and open lectures for all those willing to learn something new. That's an impressive level, as this university students ensemble LCD screens, and that is far more interesting than the titration. This is why such a famous figure as a Gordon Freeman graduated from this very university. That is why, without further ado, I decided to make one more prototype of my LCD pixel. Just I did last time, first I need to apply a micronic layer of some lacquer or glue. According to the instructions, PVA glue is the most suitable option. However, this glue is quite thick, that is why to get the needed consistency, I diluted it with water. Then, with the help of my DIY centrifuge, I am coating the electrically conductive glass sheets in a thin layer of polyvinyl alcohol. After that, it dries off pretty quickly. When the glue has dried off, just like I did earlier, I need to make micro scratches with a regular piece of fabric. I apply this technique to two electrically conductive glass sheets. Now, in order for this DIY pixel not to fall apart and to make space for liquid crystals, I'm applying some super glue to the junction of the two halves of the pixel. After that, I'm gluing two glass sheets with each other. After the glue has dried, I'm filling the space between the glass sheets with some liquid crystals. Because of their low viscosity and small size, the liquid crystals easily fill up the small space between the glass sheets as a result of capillary action. Basically, I just need to attach light polarizers on both sides of the obtained pixel, and that's it. 
However, a regular electricity supply isn't suitable for turning on and off of such a device setup. We need a more sophisticated device. According to the instructions, we need a signal generator, which I have bought specially for this experiment. This device can create signals with different frequencies and different wave shapes. For instance, it can be used for power a light emitting diode or a piezoelectric buzzer. So now I can connect my DIY pixel to the signal generator and check how it works. I have set voltage to 6 volts and set frequency to the lowest value, which is 1 Hz. Let's turn it on. Wow! My DIY pixel assembled with all special equipment works! And when the frequency changes, it blinks like a real LCD screen. I can even see how electricity travels through the glass, which makes liquid crystals immediately change their position, thus either blocking the light or letting it in. It looks like a small electric head. However, not the entire pixel changed color. There are small areas where liquid crystals either don't stick well to the glass or electricity doesn't reach them. In general, through, it looks quite spectacular. I decided to give it another try and assemble a higher quality pixel, having repeated the previous stages. After connecting my second sample, we can see that almost the entire pixel works. It worth of note that if we remove the top polarizer, we almost cannot see how the pixel works. When the top polarizing film is removed from a screen, the image disappears. The maximum blinking rate of this pixel is about 60 Hz, just like in all old screens. Evidently, the relaxation time of liquid crystals in my sample doesn't allow them to block light with a high frequency. That is why I think it can be said that my DIY pixels design doesn't differ from modern LCD screens used in calculators and other devices, for instance such as an old Nokia phone. The only difference is that modern screens come with special pre-etched segments which turn either black or grey, depending on the movement of liquid crystals. The only thing that differs my screen from multi-chrome displays is that there are no special colored luminophores in my screen, which give different colors to different pixels. So, now we can count the cost of such DIY setup, taking into account the cost of electrically conductive glass, liquid crystals and signal generator it cost me over 300 euros to assemble this setup. That is why I can only pay tribute to the Finnish engineers who over 20 years ago created a liquid crystal screen for Nokia 3310. Its screen resolution is 48 pixels by 84 pixels, which in total gives a 4032 pixel resolution of the entire screen. Of course, at that time also screens were not assembled manually, but liquid crystal screens were considered a breakthrough in technology. So I think after watching this video you have learned how liquid crystal screen work and also how much it costs to make one DIY pixel of such a screen. And if you like this video, don't forget to give it a thumbs up and subscribe to my channel to see many more new and interesting videos.